Mbemba Dizalele is a writer, foreign policy analyst, and independent journalist. He is a former Peter J. Duncan Distinguished Visiting, Visiting Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and is the author of the forthcoming biography, Mobutu, The Rise and Fall of the Leopard King. Mr. Dizalele's analyses have been published in the Journal of Democracy, New York Times, Newsweek International, International Herald Tribune, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, The New Republic, Forbes, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and other outlets. A frequent commentator on African affairs, he has been a guest analyst on PBS, NPR, the BBC, and the Voice of America. Dizalele has testified before various subcommittees of the two chambers of the United States Congress. He has also testified before the United Nations Security Council. He was a grantee of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and covered the 2006 historic elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. With the Pulitzer Center, he produced Congo's Bloody Colton, a documentary report on the relationship between the Congo conflict and the scramble for mineral resources. He served as an election monitor with the Carter Center in Congo in 2006 and 2011. He was also embedded with United Nations peacekeepers in Congo's Ituri district and South Kivu province as a reporter. He holds an international master of business and administration and a master of public policy from the University of Chicago. He also graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and French from Southern Utah University, which is perhaps part of what brings him back to Utah for our lecture today. <laughs> he is also a veteran of the United States Marine Corps and is fluent in French, Norwegian, Spanish, Swahili, Kikongo, and Lingala, and proficient in Danish and Swedish. For today's UCCD lecture, Mr. Dizalele will examine the causes and reasons that sustain the gap between natural resources and poverty in one of the world's richest countries, the Democratic Republic of Congo. The DR Congo holds some of the world's largest deposits of copper, diamond, cobalt, manganese, coltan, tungsten, tin, and uranium. It is home to the Congo River, the world's second most powerful river after the Amazon, and continues to garner international attention because of its vast rainforest. However, despite these rich natural resources and its potential, the DR Congo is known as a geological scandal and is among the world's poorest countries, as it has been plagued by failed leadership, bad governance, and conflict for the past two decades. I am happy to introduce Mr. Dizalele and his lecture, entitled, Natural Resources, A Boon or Curse for the Democratic Republic of Congo. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank my hosts, uh, the Utah Council for uh, Citizen Diplomacy, uh, Westminster, and everybody else who supported me along the way. And especially, uh, it's nice to see so many friends, some of you have not seen in a long time, to come and show your support. And I'd also like to thank our student from SUU for traveling all this time to get here. Hopefully, uh, the stuff that we say today will make some sense. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here once again. The DRC is uh, often called the other land of the world. And the reason it's called the other land of the world is because it has the second largest rainforest. And so as we talk about global warming, whether we believe in it or not, whether we believe that it's human need or not, at least we agree that it is happening. And as it's happening, what do we do to protect this? And one of the places that we look to is the DRC, along with the Amazon uh, in Brazil, and the forest of Asia, places like Indonesia, and others. So the DRC is very much at the intersection of all the problems that uh, we're facing in the world, in one way or another. It's also very much at the intersection of the various solutions that may be uh, proposed out there. But all that depends on how we, how we engage the DRC. Right. So let me just share with you, as we're going to talk 
our resources, uh, a video that I shot a few years ago that deal with these resources. And then we'll continue talking about it in, uh, as we go to the rest of the uh, presentation. Le coltan et la cassiterite et l'or, euh, ce sont des, des, minés, des minéraux euh, qui ont été des enjeux et des moteurs de la guerre. Les militaires ont même été motivés par ça. Et ce que vous et ça marqué sur le terrain, chaque fois qu'ils arrivaient sur le terrain, vous, vous, ils ne demandaient que l'or. Ils disaient où est-ce qu'on peut trouver de l'or On s'est demandé mais, mais finalement ces gens. Ils viennent pour la guerre ou bien pour chercher le minerai Les lieux de provenance du coltan d'abord étaient bien assiégés par les forces négatives appelées Mai Mai. Alors c'est tout ce Mai Mai qui, euh, qui s'est posé sur le terrain. Alors ils s'intéressaient de, 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 de creuser. C'est un homme qui gérait les creuser. Qui a profité du système à l'époque de guerre. Ah, ce sont les militaires, les, les, les chefs de guerre, les seigneurs de guerre. Ils ont profité. Well, uh, I have to say that uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, mineral resources being at the origin of the conflict that we are having here is a very questionable position. Each party, each group had to use the resources it had in the area that it was controlling. Our city was controlling the eastern part of the country, and east in the eastern part, you've got the cotton as the product which was bringing cash. Where could we make a Yes, we want to make a Now, where could we make a gun? Some of the people are going to make a gun. We are going to make Par rapport au marché euh, du coltan ou même de l'or, euh, il, faut, il faut se poser la question de savoir euh, à qui a profité le commerce. Euh, là, je dirais carrément c'est une question multinationale. Ils crèvent nus, d'abord, ils ne sont pas protégés. Ils utilisent des torches, des torches simples qu'on achète au marché ici, des trucs de deux pieds. Ils, ils ne sont pas protégés, les mains sont nues et ils utilisent des birins avec des marteaux. Et il y a des éboulements, il y en a qui meurent là-dedans. Là il y a aussi la respiration. Il n'y a pas d'air dedans. Alors, ce sont des conditions hein, inimaginables. Si on, on s'en tient à ce que coûte un téléphone ou un ordinateur par rapport à ce que gagne quelqu'un qui, qui produit le content, on va se rendre compte qu'il y a un très très grand écart. Tout ce que nous avons ici, c'est que les gens savent ici que tout ce qui s'est passé, c'est sous influence de la communauté internationale. S'ils veulent euh, s'investir dans notre pays, qu'ils ne puissent plus collaborer avec l'étranger, qu'ils viennent officiellement, qu'ils puissent signer des contrats au niveau national. Et comme ça, tous nous aurons à bénéficier, nous allons manger ici la même table. So that was actually a video that I shot several years ago. Um, 
this was in South Kivu. I will point it on the map in a little bit. Uh, but this is Coltan. Coltan is one of the resources that you need, the ore that you need that goes into your cell phone, your laptops, and many other things. So it's very much at the frontier of digital revolution. And this place, when I went there, I didn't know what to expect. This was in the war zone. It was still pretty active. As you know, Congo has been in conflict on and off for the last 20 years. And depending on where you are, it determines how much heat you feel from that war. So I went in the east, trying to cover the conflict, understand what the various drivers were, and ended up in South Kivu in this area, where it was still invested by militias. Uh, you had to go there at your own peril. In this case, you know, a friend of mine actually lent me some of his car as a vice governor. You had to get up quite early, drive like you don't care to live, don't stop for anything so you don't fall into any ambush. You get there, have your crew, cameraman, we filmed, and then you get back on one of the soldiers come put the room for you, and then you get back on your car and drive again inside like you want to commit suicide until you get back to safety. <laughs> But the result was this, uh, about 12 hour footage, I was trying to make a documentary of it. Uh, we didn't get all the funding, but the story kind of get encapsulated in this segment here. So the place where I actually was, oh, sorry, the place where I was for this video, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, it's going on. Technology, <laughs> this is where we need content. <laughs> Okay, so it was around here in South Kivu that I was. Uh, when I went, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, growing up in Zaire, in my youth, you know, the mining industry was very industrialized. And there were big concerns like Jekami, Sodiniza, and other companies that were exploited. So I'd expected that when I'm going to get there, I'll see the same type of structure. But what I found were children actually in the mines. And as you see, these are kids who are in the mines because they cannot afford to go to school or because of many other reasons. But they are mining one of the most critically important minerals in the world. And you can see the condition under which they are living. So this brings us to the question that we're discussing today. Is that a blessing or is it a boon? So the DRC, as we look at it, you know, within the context of Africa, you know, there it is. I think technology is not working with me today. Just give me a minute. Okay. So, sorry, hang on a second. Okay, so as we look at the DRC, you know, there's the continent. It is actually the second largest country landmass wise in Africa. It's about 2.3 million square kilometers. In comparison to the United States, that means it's one third the size of the United States. The United States, east of the Mississippi River, from Vermont to the Canadian border, all the way to Florida. For those of you who are European minded, it's the size of Western Europe. It's four times and a half the size of France. So in Congo, we like to say, which is true, that Congo is the largest French-speaking country. The French like to say Congo is the second most important <laughs> But in terms of sheer mass, we are in fact the largest French-speaking country. Because of its size, Congo has nine neighbors. In the US, we get upset, we talk about immigration and all that stuff. We have two neighbors. That's all we have, two neighbors. And we think it's problematic. <laughs> These guys have nine neighbors, as you can see here. And it's not particularly the most friendly in terms of countries. South Sudan is in conflict. Uganda, on and off, the dictatorship. Rwanda, they hang in there, but this is where the genocide took place that we know about. Burundi is struggling. Tanzania is relatively peaceful. Zambia is relatively peaceful. Angola is going through its own conflict. They're coming out. Uh, Congo Brazzaville is not an open armed conflict with a lot of tensions. 
of the democratization of my father. And then um, if you just go further north, you have Chad, and you go down here, that's Boko Haram territory. But at the same time, the same country, DRC, has been very much at the center of all major development that have taken place in the world. And it's because of its resources. So starting in the days of the so-called exploration, when you know, Europeans, because of the blindness of their food, decided they wanted to need some care or comments or whatever, they went around exploring this. Back then, those were the resources, very important resources. I mean, we take this for granted that we're going to spice our food. But if you were living in Liverpool at the time, that was not necessarily given. But so all the money and the funding went into this business of exploring and finding spices of all sorts, taking people all the way to Goa and others. It is also through that process that we find the so-called discoveries. So in 1482, a Portuguese explorer stumbled on the estuary of the Congo River, which he claimed that he discovered. Right? But we were there. <laughs> you discovered us? We didn't know. It's really, really here. We, this is home. This is That's my cousin. That's Who are you then? And by the way, you know the name of the river that you discovered? Of course not, right? So this started a good relationship between the Congo Kingdom at the time and Portugal. It's a relation that was very fruitful with exchanges of envoys. Uh, the Congo Kingdom became a Christian kingdom and eventually had kids go to school in Portugal and they had an envoy at the Vatican and all that was going on. Kingdom to kingdom relationship. Until another adventurer somewhere got lost and discovered some other land that he claimed to have didn't exist. By the name of Christopher Columbus. You know, he thought he was in India. And they told him, no, no, no. Here, we're not Hindu, we just we live here, Jamaica. <laughs> so that then led us to this discovery of the so-called New World, which eventually needed more resources for him to do everything we did. In this case, we went from spices to human trafficking. Eventually, people from the coast. You know, across the Gulf of Guinea, all the way from Senegal down, uh, start being abducted and trafficked into the so-called New World. So this region of Congo actually contributed up to about 25% of all the Africans who came to the United States, to South Africa. The number is greater in the islands, uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Jamaica, and others. In fact, I remember one time uh, walking on the beach in Jamaica, start talking to a fellow there. And we said, hello, can to see you start talking. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Congo. The fellow was so excited, he came to shake my hand with all the force he could, and he said, you are the original man. <laughs> I am? <laughs> original man, but what he meant, you know, for those of you who listen to reggae and other stuff, and sing a lot about Congo, Congo man. Because those countries got early consciousness of the origin, places like Haiti. Haiti became independent in 1804, defeating Napoleon's war. This was the first country run by the Africans in the New World that rebelled and succeeded. Those guys, a lot of them still remembered where they came from. They've just been in, the, in this new territory for 10 years. So a big component of people are Congo. So when he said you're the original man, that's what he meant. Oh, you are our ancestors of Haiti. And I said, please, by all means, I am original. <laughs> so this big event, which was a new set of resources going from the curry to human now, uh, depletes, of course, the, these countries along the coast of all the resources, the most important resources, which are their own human resources, right? So this entire area gets affected by that all the way. In fact, for those of you who go to New Orleans and other places in the south, in New Orleans there is a place called Congo Square. And Congo Square is a place where those Africans who came from that region used to go to relax when they were not cutting through the cane, whatever they were doing, and they would play the music. And in fact, the way you see people bury their dead 
in your audience with all that music and pop, that can be traced directly back to the contributor. That's how I think that's how I think about it. So the contribution is tremendous, but the result has been very devastating for a lot of these countries around the area. So this big chunk of land is also produces other sorts of resources. Some of the biggest global events of the last century were positive in terms of trading, since we're talking about resources, and some of them very poor in terms of trading. So as the Portuguese and the French and everybody has the superpowers of the time, we're trying to decide what they're going to do with the world, they met in Berlin in 1885. Because the Portuguese had been upset about people who were trying to encroach on their so-called discoveries. So all over here, and it became a big issue about the Congo Basin. The Congo Basin is one of the largest river basins in the world, and that's why it catch what we were talking about. It is, Congo itself is the second most powerful river in the world, only second to the Amazon. And both the Congo River and the Amazon River straddle the equator which makes it consistent in the level of the regime of water it reverses into the sea. So it's not like when I first came to this country, I kept on hearing about the Colorado River. And then I went to see the thing. It was at the brook. <laughs> right? Because it dries up time, some way it floods. It depends on where you catch this river. You know? So I always remember driving somewhere in the Midwest and coming across this big, huge water body of water. And I was like, it's got to be the Mississippi. Because for once I see a big river in this country. So, but as you see in this place, rivers are all over the place. You know, they're just all over the place. So, this Congo River became very interesting to all the powers of the time. And in fact, the, the conference that the Portuguese called for at the time is called the Congo Conference, which eventually came to be known as the Berlin Conference, where they wanted to decide who's going to what. And eventually, the king of Belgium, who had his own ambitions at the time, Belgium being a small country that nobody respected, um, he was very annoyed by this. In the old days, when people wanted to duke it out and they wanted to fight, they said, You may see what we meet you in Belgium. <laughs> Remember Napoleon? The Brits and the French could just fight in the channel. It was not complicated. Hey Nelson, bring your ship over here. Commandant so and so will meet you and they will not look it out. They said no Belgium. You know, and the Belgian we just resent it. You know, the Spaniards want to settle this war with the French, they met in Belgium. So what you do, that's when it happened. For that's why it happened for Napoleon. And he shouldn't have gone, they should have just put them on the other side. So remember to decide where you want to have your fight to your advantage. So this guy, of course, when he was dreaming big, at one point he wanted to acquire China. Because so Belgium can be an important power. And we can always do it. In this country, we talk about the American dream. I think there's a Belgian dream trying to acquire China. When it didn't work, he went to acquire the Philippines. It didn't work. So eventually, at that conference, he fought hard to acquire this piece of real estate called Congo. So he positioned himself as a philanthropist. He said, I'm going to help them. I'm going to bring them Jesus, I'm going to bring them civilization, I'm going to help them fight against Arabs in their trade. So it became his private property. But the other powers, they were not happy about it. It's small Belgium, we are friends, why would we do this? So when you read the preambles and the proceedings of the Berlin Conference, it actually made Congo a global trading outfit. In other words, even though the king claimed it as his private property, which he called the Congo Free State, which was neither free or a state, the guy said, we want to keep an eye on So you find all kinds of people in Congo. You find the British consulate, you find the various branches of European foreign affairs, all of them working there. And the king needed legitimacy of sorts. Because the other European power would just not respect him. He decided he's going to turn to this country, the United States of America. A former US ambassador, by the fellow 
the fellow by the name of Hugh Sheldon um, Stanford, came back to the US and he became in love with, with the king. The king was very savvy. And the one thing that is very unique for the US is not the wall, not what Trump says, <laughs> but it's actually our political system in this country. You only need to convince two or three congressmen to be on the side, and they can commit an entire country to think that the rest of America is going on. So he courted three or four senators and congressmen from the South and told them about this great place and why it's important to them. They said that's a good idea. So the United States will recognize Congo. So the United States became the first country in the world to recognize the Congo Free State. Why were they, why were they interested in these guys from Alabama, people like Tyler Morgan and others? Well, the ideology of the time was that we're going to send all our leaders back to Africa. We need to keep this country white. So Tyler Morgan says, that Congo stuff, can we send all of them there? So the idea was this would be a place where we can send all our Negroes there. And as it turned out, the early missionaries who show up in Congo in the 1800s are actually blacks from Virginia. There are a few black, few white people there, but a lot of them are blacks from Virginia, from Hampton. So as they arrived there, one with a monk other thing, they also start noticing things that were not quite correct. Like uh, the tremendous exploitation of the people by the Belgian agents. The big commodity at the time is one that fueled the Industrial Revolution. It's called rubber. So we had coal on site when our train was here. But we need coal for the pneumatic of the automobile industry and everything else that was being developed. And Congo had that in great numbers, especially in this trial over here. And the king in his greed, because this was not the philanthropy. Philanthropy was discovered in the great civilization, but we really need to make money. So he brought a lot of his friends, the JP Morgan and everybody else, into this venture, where they would generate a lot of rubber and then feed this industrial revolution. But for him, this was the point, since we're talking about this. Made tremendous money, but for the local, this was just pure devastation. If your village did not meet its quota, then the king's agent start chopping off limbs of your single soldiers, or they'll set your village ablaze, or they'll set your field ablaze. So people start dying, bleeding, other situations, disease and others, and eventually, some of his agents actually, the way they showed that they were doing their job was by collecting the limbs of the people that were there. So he showed them with hands, he said, I did my job today. This way you can justify the good that the officer gave you and stuff. The king tried to hide this. He was very good in PR. Again, the guys in Congress are just still supporting him. Uh, but eventually, those missionaries, this also at the turn of the century, where camera and photography is being invented. So they can capture some of these images, which have become really infamous now that we see more. Somebody else also noticed something else. A young clerk was in Liverpool, working at the dock there. Uh, he was working for a company that had a monopoly of trade in Congo. Remember, this is supposed to be a global, global trading outpost. He noticed that when ship came to Liverpool, they were packed and full of trading goods. Ivory, rubber, whatever that they were trying to get there. But when the same trip, uh, the same ship went back, they went back either empty or with things that were not did, did not that necessarily reflect the trade, such as guns and bullets and those kind of things. So this was, I think, as Trump would say, a serious trade deficit. Right? It's like we are just giving these people what's happening. So this young uh, cleric kind of investigated more, start connecting the dots. And with what the missionaries start doing. So, this period between 1885 in the Congo Free State to 1908, about 10 to 15 million Congolese perished through the devastation that I just described. It raised a big uproar, it was kind of the first Holocaust. And the international media, through various means, start catching into this. And then we had what we call the Congo Reform Movement. People like uh, Sir. Uh, Conan Doyle, of Sherlock Holmes, 
people like Mark Twain, in fact Mark Twain wrote a pamphlet called King Leopold's Soliloquy, and others thinking to this, Teddy Roosevelt and others, was a tremendous uproar around the world, and the king was forced to relinquish his so-called private estate. So here we have, we've gone from this fight to human trafficking to the Industrial Revolution on the back of the people of the Congo. The next thing that comes then is Congo get equated, if you will, to the Belgian as a colony. And that's when it becomes the Belgian Congo. And this time it's just the Belgian doing their own thing. They build everything as a colony of exploitation. That means the roads, the ports, everything you do is for the sake of evacuating the merchandise, not for the sake of building a place to live. Even what you teach the natives, so to speak, is the basic arithmetic reading, so they can do the bookkeeping about the material that you export. But nothing ever happens in the vacuum. You know, we often think of always the heart of darkness to Joseph Conrad and other stuff, but it actually was very much connected to the rest of the world, as one can see. In fact, feeding the rest of the world in its uh, greed or its needs. So the next big event that happens in this time, not a battery, but very much global, that affects the region, is World War I. Because World War I is, a, is truly a global event. We do not often study it that way because we talk about the great powers, Europe fighting. But World War I takes place across the globe. Right? So in this case here, sorry, um, this is a uh, German colony in 1940. This is a German colony. This is a German colony. This is a German colony, and a few other German colonies here. So as the Belgians start fighting, as the Europeans start fighting on this side there, it is actually on this side of the world, it is the Congolese army that ties with some other British here to vanquish the Germans over here. So it's actually the Congolese army, the colonial army, the Congolese troops who fight the German, kick them out of Rwanda, kick them out of Burundi, and kick them out of Tanzania. What that does is create a new set of conscientization among the Congolese troops, and among the many other African troops, depending on what country they are, and who are fighting the French colonial troops doing the same thing in the other country. They start demanding a little more, even though the white officers say, hey, don't get any ideas. They try actually to crank more because they're afraid of the, the mystique of the white officer, the colonial, is being demystified. Right? It no longer exists. Because you've seen them in combat, you see that they flee like you, you see that some of them are pretty cowardly. It's the Congolese sergeant who took over the event, those kind of things. But the colonial responsible are kind of afraid of this. The next thing that's happened then is World War II. And here again, Congo it becomes very important because of copper, the large deposit of cobalt and others, which we need for our weapons, our bombs, and everything we have to use. But most importantly, as Europe surrenders, you know, D-Day and others normally, the Pacific does not surrender. Japan, Imperial Japan is still fighting, and the one thing that we need that makes the Manhattan Project possible, I'm sure it will have gone, but the thing that made it possible is uranium from Congo. So Little Man and Fat Boy, which are the two bombs US dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were made of Congolese uranium. So it's not exactly Wakanda that is choice. <laughs> so it is that thing that really came to make the difference. In fact, Congo has a nuclear reactor. Congo is the only African country with a nuclear reactor. It doesn't work very well, but it's there. And uh, it was actually a gift from the US as a program as part of the Atom for Peace and the Eyes of Africa to thank the people of Congo for the contribution to this. So World War II happens, the Congolese troops, again like many other the colleagues in Africa, burden the, the, the weight of the war in Africa among the colonial powers. But the Congolese troops, this time they fight in Ethiopia. It is the Congolese troops that actually defeat the Italians. So in 1941, nine Italian generals of the troops surrendered to Congolese colonial troops in the summer of 1941. 
which ended in so many crap, harassed and great form of material. Nine of them, including his vice chancellor of the who used to be in police ministry of war, was feeling immediately. <coughs> the Congolese are also in Burma, they're also in uh, the Middle East. So when they come back, like everybody else, this is a global, a proportion, uh, a big uh, event of global proportion that we typically forget. In the US, we have people like the Tuskegee Airmen, and others who are coming home and say, why do I sit in the back of the bus? I just fought for World War II, all this stuff. So that's happening, and it's not changing things around the world, from India all the way to the US. India becoming independent, and then the entire independent movement that actually is very quickly. Uh, the next thing that then happened is we need to hold land. The US, the police, or Soviet Union, right? Is the Congo. So Congo, because of its strategic location on one level, let's see, uh, let's see what I mean by the strategic level, location. So here's Congo. Congo started the equator. Because it started the equator, it is the middle of Africa. We serve a control, this can control a lot of things. This is called war thing. If you control Congo it quickly, it's not very far to South Africa. It's not very far to the, Atlantic, to the uh, Indian Ocean. It's not very far to the and from here, to get to the Mediterranean, as you can see, just about four hours in the Mediterranean. So it became a very important real estate place for, for the U.S. And by all means, the U.S. wanted to hold this U.S. So what the U.S. does is we supported the various dictatorships that take place, including Mobutu, who was very much a CIA man, because we felt that this country cannot fall into communist hands because A, the resources that B, we will lose the area. Everybody else who surrounded the DRC was not trustworthy. Here you had communist, communist, socialist, communist, socialist. Here, you know, not sure, here, not sure. But you want to keep that peace. So the other thing then that becomes very important for this part of the Atlantic, because this country, the United States, is either, since World War II, we are either in the middle of the war, getting out of the war, or preparing to get. That has been really what we've been doing for the last, since World War II. We're trying to get to Korea. Is that okay? So this, we're finishing Iraq, we're finishing Afghanistan, and we're saying, maybe we should bomb Korea. But that's what we do. Throughout those years, throughout the 70s, for DRC, the main thing becomes the Vietnam War. Right? So we wear the Vietnam War with a lot of backing from, the, from Zaire. Back then it was called Zaire. Because all the bullets and the bombs and the cobalt that we need for our machinery in Vietnam also is traced here. Now, the US is rich, the US is gold, copper, and stuff. But the US is also a very strategic country that needs to outsource or insource the material for us. In this time, during the Vietnam years, the Vietnam years, you know, 65, 75, this country is doing very well. This is the boon part of the country. The resources are and because of that resource that is so tremendous, it's also the time of the Dutch disease. So in 1971, 72, the currency of Zaire is called Zaire. And the exchange rate of Zaire to the dollar is one Zaire, two dollars. Right? So the purchasing power of the people are here is actually pretty good. Every Congolese student who finished high school, who could go to accept the university, get a scholarship, and you get a stipend. Not only get that, but the country, if you live over here, and you get accepted to the university here, when the time to go back to school arrives, the university system will charter airplanes to go around the country and collect all the students who are going to various places. You know, Zaire has one of the largest airlines at the time, called El Zaire. In fact, you had flights from Kinshasa to New York. It's kind of hard to imagine that, but that stuff was happening there. And so the flight will go from Kinshasa with a stop in Abidjan, here, and then straight to New York. So it's a time of really tremendous war. This is the years where the rumble in the jungle happened. For those of you who are, you remember that, Mobutu finance because Congo had the money. There were just a lot of money in the country for finance. 
Uh, Congo also in Mobutu invested a lot from that money into building national unity, into um, creating a sense of national identity through the arts, through sports. Uh, in fact, Zaire then becomes the first, the second African country to go to the World Cup in 1974. The first one being Morocco, that went to the World Cup in 1970, and then Zaire in 74. And in those days, you ask, why is this important? In back in those days, the entire continent only had one small Now, the UK, God bless their heart, they don't go to the World Cup as one country. Yeah, they, fought, they fight it all themselves, they go to the World Cup as three countries. The Scots don't want to play in the same team as the English, so Scotland goes to the World Cup as Scotland, with a Scottish flag. White flag on the football cards. England goes to the World Cup as England. With the King James, St. James flag, white and blue cross, and red cross. The old Jack doesn't appear in the World Cup. This is like Texas going to the World Series as Texas. Now I know in Texas they love that idea, but the rest of you are sure like it. But yet you have an entire continent. So in order for you to succeed to go to the World Cup, you have to be pretty good to go around there. They take a serious beating, but they made the point they still want to work. So these are the kind of situations that we have where resources are being used. But because this is part of the general world, you cannot just be living in your own resources in your context. The oil risk, the oil bust happened, right? The oil crisis in 72. The gold standard gets dismissed, and the country suffers because the reserves for the planning are not. And the copper, the cost of copper goes down. And then everything comes that starts crashing. But as the stuff starts crashing in terms of commodity prices, the regime in Kinshasa, the Mobutu regime, becomes very dictatorial. So on one level, you have the economy going this, this way, and you have a regime that is becoming more dictatorial. So which means government suffers. Now they're just trying to survive. So all of a sudden, from 1984 or so, Students don't get their scholarships anymore because there's a lot of pressure to instruct the adjustment programs in the World Bank, IMF, and others. Uh, it's very hard for you to find your health programs. Uh, people are on your neck, breathing and saying, your army is too big, you need to stop, reduce the numbers if you want. Uh, so it becomes very problematic, the countries start kind of altering. But during all those years, also the US and other European countries are still relying on Zaire for many other strategic geopolitical reason. So Zaire is an army that is relatively adequate. It is the Congolese army that the US used to stop, they try to stop the economy over here. It is the Congolese army that trains a lot of the neighboring countries. It is also the Congolese army that in the 80s stopped Gaddafi's foray into Chad. But absolute power corrupting absolutely, things stay on the political side continue to come down until Mugutu eventually get kicked out of the country when people wanted change. And that change came which a crescendo after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Because after the, Berlin, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, everybody wanted democracy. And a lot of these countries they couldn't provide it. And Zaire was one of those. But because nobody lives in the vacuum, whether you have resources or not, the weak state in DRC is start getting weak. Did not expect a major event that happened in Rwanda. Genocide in 94. The genocide in 94 caused a problem that is very common now, which is refugees bring conflict. Right? Refugees flee conflict, and then they bring conflict where they go. They don't bring conflict because they want to create conflict. They bring conflict because by their sheer presence, they start putting pressure on the lack of resources of whatever space they have. Right? All of a sudden, refugees show up here about two million Rwandans, they start eating your corn. Right? They come to your farm, they plant whatever mango you planted, they don't ask for permission, they need to survive. They're asking for jobs, they're cutting woods, uh, you need the wood to keep. So it's an entire, we see this in Europe now, with the refugees from Syria and everywhere else. So it's a very serious problem when refugees come. People want to help them, but then they start draining the resources. And this happened there, and eventually their presence led to Kagame in Rwanda to try to invade and eventually created an entire 
invasion of the Eighth Great War, 96, 97. This is the conflict that still plays with us in various forms that has taken us since we moved here. So fast forward to today, where are we? We are in a country that, again, in the third round of feed, feeding global events in terms of the survival of wealth, where Colton, the stuff that I started with, was keeping those pets. Now it is those resources that are funding our next step, which is the digital or TV revolution. Is your computers, is your internet, is your video games, and everything else. It's also the cobalt. You want to drive your hybrid Prius, you want to drive your electric car. Well, that electric car, the battery of that car, and the battery of the many other things that we will need come from here, from the cobalt. Today, cobalt is one of the most expensive minerals. I think it, should, it sells like at uh, 90,000 a ton or something like that. I mean, a kilo, I mean, uh, a ton. So it's really a lot of money that is there. Kabila has decided that he's going to use this now for his own whatever he wants to do. But the Congolese are not. While you guys are using computers, most Congolese keep the technology for the more access to computers. They have cell phones because the penetration rate of cell phones. Is high. Um, while we're talking about, you know, Elon Musk is talking about creating a car, the next car, electric car, most of the don't have cars. So this is kind of where we are in where we go next. So the other element that is very important also in looking at Congo is its river I started talking about. So what does this mean? Beside the forest, the advantage in terms of arable or mastland is impressive because in Congo you don't have food scarcity. We do have problems now. Excuse me, but we have those problems because the governance is not working. It's a problem of governance. Because Congo struggled the equator, the equator is around there. Because Congo struggled the equator, food production is constant. In other words, when it's dry season in the south and you don't have mangoes, you don't have what kind of commodities? It is rain season in the north, and they're producing exactly the same stuff that people in the north can, the south can produce. The south is producing another set of produce that the other guys are not doing. So it's alternate. And in some areas of Congo, because of high altitude, like over here in the Kivus, they actually have two harvest seasons. So they don't just harvest once, they harvest twice. So you can see that the richness of it, it's amazing. Uh, and the river itself and the basin makes Congo hold 50% of the hydroelectric power potential of Africa. So the two largest dams in Africa are actually Congo, Inga 1 and Inga 2 that are here. The thing about developing that, and this is just the two things. If the Inga projects were to be fully developed, then Congo can sell power all the way down to South Africa, which is doing well now, not at full capacity. But it can also sell power all the way to the east, all the way to uh, Saudi Arabia, Spain, Italy, and the other country in West Africa. So you get another set of resources, which is not neither ore or mineral, just like the waters. And then you have the rainforest, which I explained about. <laughs> And then the most important resource of them all is actually human resources. Congo is the fourth largest country in Africa in terms of population. So it's the fourth most populated country in Africa after Nigeria, Ethiopia, Egypt. So again, you have all the resources there. Then let me ask you what is the problem? Well, the problem is governance, the problem is leadership. So this kind of frames this, I hope, for us to get the discussion.